All right. Well, uh, welcome back, everyone, again. It's uh, my distinct uh, pleasure to introduce the moderator of our panel, following the fascinating lecture by Professor Freeman. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Professor Stanley Chan, who is an Elmer Associate Professor in the Elmer Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and also in the Department of Statistics at Purdue University. Uh, so Dr. Chan uh, does research in computational imaging. He is particularly interested in the uh, photon limited imaging, imaging through atmospheric turbulence and robust machine learning. Uh, Dr. Chan is the recipient of the best paper award in the IEEE International Conference on Image Processing in 2016. And he has also received a number of uh, distinguished um, teaching awards uh, at Purdue University. He is currently serving as an associate editor of the IEEE Transactions and Computational Imaging and was a former associate editor of the OSA Optics Express. So with that, um, thank you again, uh, Stanley. Okay, so um, um, I know Bill has a uh, very uh, interesting interactive um, um, activities, which I'm really, really looking forward to. Um, so uh, maybe I'll just pass the time. Um, you know, let's do some exercise. Uh, I'm going to raise my hand if you ask a question, OK? Um, feathers, wings, and future uh, of computer vision research. And then after that, uh, we have um, a couple uh, faculty here. We can really check about uh, the, uh, this issue. And um, just to, um, how much time should I, I, mean, I can really, Taylor, to whatever length of time I should s spend on the slides. What would you like? Sure. Um, how about 15 okay. minutes? Great. Perfect. Uh, okay. Thanks. Um, hi again. And um, so uh, the, the, the prompt was, you know, what, what's ahead for the future? And um, I, I, I have, I want to share with you this. Um, so there's slides that kind of talks about the future of computer vision and, and my, my viewpoint on it. Um, so the first thing to say is a disclaimer that this is a this is a cartoon you're going to see. This is just a cartoon story. It's it's you know there's a lot of subtlety that I'm just not going to go into. So um, so please don't get upset if I sound like I'm being kind of black or white. Uh, it's just uh, this that's going to be the style of this presentation. Um, a cartoon is something that maybe looks like the original, but it's just it's very simplified, and that's what this is. Okay, um, so, you know, as, as we all know, there's been a revolution in, well, in science, really, but in, in particular in, in computer vision and image processing, and um, a, a sort of cartoon description of how we generated papers between 2013 and 2021 is you could say that you take this, this standard textbook on computer vision uh, by Forsyth and Ponce, open it to any random page, and look at the topic on that page and put the word deep in front of it, or add the word GAN behind it or something. And, and then, uh, you know, collect a training set, build a model that implements that, and publish. Uh, again, a cartoon, you know, forgive me, but that's a lot of what happened. And, um, and you can, you can actually almost verify this. You can go look for, you know, say the topic is texture and go Google deep texture CVPR and you find a paper on it. Deep epipolar geometry CVPR, you find a paper on it. Just any anything in the in the textbook on computer vision, you put deep in front of it, CVPR behind it, you find a paper. Um, and uh, and what's, let's see, you know, and, and what is it that worked so well? Well, you know, um, there was this really very simple model of uh, processing developed by Hubert and Wiesel and, of course, others of, of you know, convolutions with a nonlinearity following it and then repeat that in many layers. Uh, again, the cartoon version. Jan LeCun implemented this in a, in a tastefully done network of convolutions, uh, nonlinearities, multiple layers, and, and um, you know, to emulate the, the biology. And what was the result of this kind of very first step in emulating the biology? Unprecedented impact and academic success, just unprecedented, you know, just amazing. And, you know, Turing Awards to the 
leaders in the field, but but uh, so much uh, revolution from this, just taking the first step toward doing things the way people do. So if taking one step uh, gives you these incredible results, making maybe taking two steps in that direction is going to be even better. So that's that's the kind of point of this talk. Um, and so let's use something else from human vision and visual neurophysiology and incorporate that into our vision systems. And maybe that'll take us to a, an even better place. So there's a lot of things you could use, uh, you know, from psychology, from um, uh, perception literature. So then here now is therefore a, a model for how to make papers in computer vision for the next five years. Again, this is just a cartoon, you know, forgive the flippantness of all this. But um, you could take the this uh, a nice, there's a really wonderful, it's getting old now, but a wonderful uh, vision science, human vision textbook, vision science, and open it to some random page and uh, look at that concept and develop an architecture which implements that concept into your vision system and then publish it. So that's, that's the model for the next five years. Uh, and if you don't want to use that older textbook, you can use the most recent uh, VSS, Visual Sciences Society uh, conference abstracts. Okay, but there's one tweak, and that is there's a lot of kind of human and neurophysiology which may be idiosyncratic to biology. And my image for that is kind of related to flight. Like, of course, um, you know, all birds, uh, birds fly and birds have wings, but they also have feathers. And it seems to me that, you know, feathers are kind of idiosyncratic to the biology. I'm sure they're aerodynamically very important, but we've got a whole uh you know aerospace industry built on winged featherless flying machines and and so somehow we've got the sense that the wings are important and the feathers are kind of uh side effects of the biology and so the game is when you look at that human neurophysiology textbook to decide what of these concepts are feathers and which ones are wings you know which ones are idiosyncratic aspects of the biology and which ones are really fundamental things. And just as a mnemonic to help us remember that, um, we note that if you take a human and add wings to them, you get a flying human. And if you take a human and add feathers to them, well, you know, not so much. Um, so um, so th th anyway, this, this part is interactive. I don't know if it's going to work so well on Zoom. I'll, I'll try it. Okay, see how it goes. So here's a list of human uh, psychology or neurophysiology features. And I'd like you to tell me whether you think they correspond to feathers or to wings. You know, are they something we should put into our computer vision algorithms or can we kind of ignore them? Okay, here's the first one. And um, I, I don't know how to do this, but you could, you could, it's fine with me if you unmute, if you're allowed to. Um, I, I don't really see the chat in my stream, so I'm not sure how I'll do that. But okay, first one is uh, dorsal and ventral path, visual pathways. So the, the, the visual processing kind of breaks into two streams, a where system and uh, which handles motion and things, and a what system, which handles kind of static uh, imagery. Any, um, any ideas whether this is feathers or wings? And how do I get feedback from the audience? Hmm. So I can't hear anyone. Maybe you're not able to unmute yourselves. And I don't really see the chat in my when I'm presenting. So So I can click a reaction um, button. Can, okay. can you see the reaction here? I can, yes, I can see that. Right. So how about we use green uh, check to say this is a uh, wing and then a red cross to uh, say this is uh okay. okay. Okay, good. So I see, I see a, a green wing. So uh, there's a feathers and I see two votes. One green, okay, it's a couple of greens and uh, green is wings. Okay. And then in the interest of time, I better just um, kind of go through some of this. Um, so I think it's feathers. I, I, I'm not sure really that it's essential for vision. Of course, some people disagree with this, but um, I, I, I just think you can do it other ways. Um, okay, next one, sorry. Explicit representation of border ownership. So um, here's a picture from a uh, segmented image database. Um, and if you look at all the horse pixels, it looks like this. Um, this one, sorry, I'll just, I'll just, I'll run through this one because I really uh, interested the time. 
I think if you don't really ex explicitly represent which ones are the edge borders and who owns the border, you'll just get, it'll be so hard to uh, learn what the shape of a horse is and so forth, because this shape on the right of horse pixels uh, includes the occluder in front of it. And because and, you haven't represented it properly by, by, by properly saying that the border between her leg and the horse is owned by her, it's not owned by the horse, whereas the border from the horse to the background is owned by the horse anyway. So I think, therefore, that um, this is uh, this is wings. I think it's essential, and this is part of my little program to try to put the vision back in vision and learning. I think we need to re recruit some of these concepts from human psychophysics and put them back into our machine learning algorithms. Um, actually, really in, in interest of time, I, I think I'll, I won't do the interactive. In, I won't do the interactive version of this one because it's kind of hard for me to poll the people. But I'll, I'll go through these, and you should think, please, on your own. Think about the answer to this one. Feathers or wings, contour completion. Um, I think it's essential. Um, so uh, there, this little video on the top left is a is a, a thing of a chair, and, and we could only get the correct contours if we really analyze the grouping properly. If you if you just look at motion alone, it, it just totally fails on this problem. And so I think that um, contour completion is, is an essential piece, which we're not really putting into our algorithms currently, as far as I can see. Um, foveation, you know, we see the world in this really strange way where our fovea is high resolution, everything else is low resolution. Is that critical? Well, um, I think for consumer applications, it's critical. You know, it's, you've got to be efficient. And for, um, but for academic research, I just think it's, not essential. I think it's it's feathers for that. And uh, Jeffrey, I'm trying to infer what you're thinking by by how your expression. But well, I'll hear from you in the in the panel. Um, uh, perceptual grouping. I I just I'm so in favor of that. It's just got to be wings. <laughs> um, otherwise, how do you put things together? Um, trichromacy. Do we need RGB to perceive the world? So sometimes I think wings. Sometimes I think feathers. I think people have persuaded me it's probably feathers. You know, you can get by with black and white camera. Um, the brain is amazingly power efficient, uh, low heat dissipation, portable. Is that a critical part of vision? Well, again, I think for consumer applications, yes. But I think for academic research, perhaps no. And then finally, um, having both feed forward and feedback connections. That's something that's very prevalent in the human visual system. and. It's present in some artificial systems, but not many. But I think that's also a critical piece in terms of kind of validating your internal representations of what's out in the world. I think you have to have feedback connections. So, um, so that's my little spiel, and I don't want to take up more of the panel time. And I really look forward to what other people have to say. And so I'll stop sharing now. And thank you very much. Um, sorry that the interactive part is harder over Zoom. Hey, thank you, thank you, Bill. Um, so, um, so let me just introduce our um, panel today. Um, um, so we have um, Professor Katik Ramani from Mechanical Engineering, um, and we have Professor Jeff Siskin from Electrical Engineering. We also have Maggie Drew from um, Electrical Engineering. Um, so, I really like this uh, exercise. Um, um, I think it is really, really interesting in the sense that. Um, um, I guess we are, we're looking at a problem, right? We're looking at the problem of um, what what would be the interesting things to to think about um, in the next um, five or ten years or twenty years ahead of time. Um, so I want to hear hear the perspective of, of the panels, right? We we, we have we hear some um, perspective from um, Dr. Freeman. Um, maybe I'll just open up the floor and, and ask what 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 do the panels think about in the future of um, um, computer vision. What are the interesting problems that, uh, in your opinion, we should uh, we should spend some effort on? Anyone? Jeff, do you want to start first? Okay. So I uh, share Bill's um, general view that um, uh, we're lacking a lot of. Um, incorporation of what we know about human vision in our computer vision research, um, both at the psychophysical level and at the uh, uh, neurophysiology level. Um, 
I, I think there's a fundamental difference between engineering problems and scientific problems. And um, a lot of the approaches that people take might be good from an engineering perspective, um, but they don't actually exhibit um, human level behavior and they don't actually work the way human vision or biological vision more generally work. Um, and uh, uh, one critical difference is that machine learning systems are trained on absolutely huge data sets and humans are not. Um, humans, when they're growing up, don't see um, a million or 14 million images from ImageNet uh, flicker in front of their eyes um, at, uh, at five hertz for the first uh, few years of their lives. And they don't um, actually see images, the same image more than once, and the images don't come labeled. So um, how human vision works, um, I don't believe that um, object recognition is a process that is learned. I believe that that is almost completely innate and the only learned aspect to it is the um, linguistic labels that we assign to categories that the innate human visual system um, can differentiate. Um, and I think that whole approach to vision is something that largely the community is not addressing right now. And um, it might not be relevant from an engineering perspective, but it's definitely relevant from a scientific perspective. Great. Maybe I should ask um, Katik, um, um, from an engineering or science perspective? <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, I tend to um, sort of uh, inform the basics um, from uh, perspectives that uh, you gather in the real world in some sense. Uh, and, and to uh, Bill's point of view, I was just looking at some of his recent uh, papers, you know, what can you learn when staring at a blank wall? It sort of uh, was analogous to some of the uh, examples he was giving. But I also was looking at some of his patents. Um, one of your most cited uh, patents, Bill, from 1997 was this uh, hand gesture machine control system. Uh, with Weisman. Uh, I still work in that area, but of course, uh, and been publishing in computer vision and ECCV, CVPR and ICCV, all of them. Uh, but of course, at times change, the sensing modalities change, uh, the context changes, and we want to solve problems with uh, fewer assumptions about the environments and context. So I think to that point of view, um, you know, your, your uh, analogies of feed forward, feedback, and uh, perceptual grouping. I completely agree with this contour completion. It's not used, but I don't think that you have to be a wing or a feather. Um, you can be both. <laughs> so I sort of uh, uh, buy into this perspective of A plus B equals C that uh, combining applied and basic together can actually uh, feed back into the basics uh, as well as feed forward into the applied, uh, partly because I'm biased, I kind of do that all the time. Uh, so so my perspective there is, uh, you, you know, you can be both a, 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 a wing as well as a feather, um, depending on um, where you want to go with the publications. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I kind of buy into uh, the notions that both um, um, uh, uh, Bill as well as, um, Jeff, uh, point out to that a uh, lot of computer vision problems, of course, learning consumes so much of energy. We do so much, so many things in our brain with um, extremely less energy, and we are able to make out a lot of things just by looking at shadows and so on and so forth, right? So uh, certainly inspiring uh, computer vision problems with um, uh, the kinds of ideas that uh, Bill actually very nicely presented, uh, I think is really good for science perspectives. Mm, wonderful. How about Maggie? Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, um, I think it's you know very interesting exercise. Um, and thanks, Dr. Freeman, for doing that. Um, Zoom is difficult, um, but I think we still see some consensus, I guess, you know, based on these set of um, exercises. Um, so I think I sort of agree with you know the concept of depending on what perspective we're looking, right? In terms of whether it's you know a wing or a feather problem. But sometimes, you know, we it can, that can be ambiguous, right? So, for example, um, I think one of the uh, 
the question we little quiz we had was looking at efficiencies, right, of you know these models. But I think you know in terms of efficiency, there are also different ways of interpreting this, right? It could be you know um, do we want to build a very efficient model architecture from you know the point of power consumption and so on, as you know, Dr. Romani pointed out. But also, what about, you know, understanding the design itself, right? So are we trying to build just a black box design type of, you know, efficient um, network or so on? Or are we really thinking about, uh, you know, the, uh, the theoretical side, the physics, you know, foundations of, you know, doing the design and then making this a white box? And maybe that is more efficient. Um, so I think there's a lot of, you know, interesting um, perspective and thoughts behind how we look at, you know, whether or not the problem itself is better or win, right? Um, so another example I think is important is, you know, we're trying to at least, you know, attempt to mimic or have a better understanding or modeling of, you know, the human vision system. But a lot of times the problems that we encounter do need to include, you know, human as a input. Right. Um, and then, you know, how do we uh, do that, uh, you know, by engaging the human, but also provide um, that level of autonomy um, to a lot of these practical problems. So these are all things, you know, I'm very interested. Um, and I think these are um, kind of, I hope, the future direction of where we're going. Uh, that's a good point. So Maggie, you're mentioning a very good point. So human eye, right? So I want to ask another question would be, human eye, right? So when we think about computer vision research, one of the really, really ultimate goal is that I'm going to make an eye, artificial eye, that can do um, as much as a human eye or maybe more. Mm -hmm. Should this be the goal of computer vision or actually that should be something else, right? Should we want, should we ask the computer vision system to do something complementary to human or do we want it to just replace human eyes? Well, I, I, I know there's a sort of domain specific, but I want to just hear um, comments from, from maybe Maggie and other, 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 other folks here. Well, I, I mean, oh. uh, maybe we have to hey. Well, hey, I'm not allowed ahead. to turn on my video, so I guess I'll just turn on the... Oh. Uh, can we, can we make Ed, Ed, Ed turn on the video, Maria? Let me see. We're working on it. Yes. There we go. Oh, here we go. So that was about the question I was going to ask, uh, and it's, I was going to make it much more provocative. So, so, so I'll, I'll direct, I'll, I'll address this to our, to our guests. So Bill, why does, uh, why does it have to work? A computer vision system work like a human vision system work? In other words, you could say you get insights maybe from human from human vision, um, but um, is that the only way to go? I mean, is there a, is there another approach you can take? Um, and this this you know sort of dovetails off of Stanley's question too. Um, yeah, and it's a great question. I guess I'm. Um, let's see. I mean, so one answer you might say on, uh, which is not my answer, but it's a perfectly reasonable one. You know, an example of that is like the AlphaGo or, or the chess programs that, that totally beat humans and do it in a very different way than humans do it. Uh, so why, you know, why, do, why should perception be any different? And, uh, you know, certainly that's a, a, a great point. Um, I guess I feel like right now human vision is just so far ahead of, of computational vision uh, that that you just can't go wrong by trying to make it more like a human vision system. But I do certainly acknowledge that um, eventually when we get our act together and understand things better, uh, surely it's just got to be the case that, um, you, you know, why, why does it have to, machines have all these different set of constraints than humans have. And, you know, machines don't have to grow up from an infant into, a, into an organism. And that's surely going to be a big constraint that, that changes things. Uh, so, so in principle, no, it doesn't have to be like people. But, but we're just so far away from what people can do that I think a very reasonable kind of step right now is to just try to copy what people do somehow and, and, and work on that. But, but I, I understand that that's not in the long run maybe what we need to do. Well, I mean, and I, I agree with Jeff's point. I think object recognition uh, is, is probably inherent and we just put labels on it. And 
I think there's some evidence of that, maybe even to a certain extent in in, in animals, and and certainly also th- uh, you know 3D vision. So, but but yeah, I, I always worry that maybe we're we're we want the neurologist to solve our problem for us. Yeah, no, um, I see. So, so yeah. anyway. And I also want to jump in that, you know, if you look at other biology in spite, you know, camera sensors, so on, they don't necessarily look like human eyes, right? But they have very, you know, specific unique characteristics. And then, you know, we have a lot of, I think, faculties, researchers in the field that are exploring those possibilities, and they may be designed for specific type of applications, right? Um, But I think, you know, definitely taking inspiration from biology is, you know, one way that you know, to go as the future direction. Yeah. Oh, you're muted. Kadid, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I have a comment, uh, you know, to add on to Maggie's comment and also a question to uh, Bill. You know, is, is uh, how we think about uh, AI, right? Is it is it going to, you know, how is it going to be used eventually, uh, right? Uh, one is doing the science, but also uh, how does the science get used? You know, is it going to extend uh, humans or is it going to relieve us of doing some work or uh, is it like like a backup or is it being designed to replace uh, some of our things right so I think I think uh, this complementarity of what we want to do with it uh, has a lot to do in terms of uh, how you might uh, think about it I don't know what your perspectives there are um, everybody in the panel but also uh, Bill Mm. well I just to um uh, mention a point that's in the opposite of what I was kind of saying before. You could imagine if you were really successful at building a vision system like a human, that then your airport security vision system would also get bored and get distracted and and not be able to just stare at something for 10 hours straight as you would like our machines to be able to do, and which is so hard for humans to do. Um, so, so indeed, you want to diverge from, uh, you want to have, as you're saying, you want to have a complementary set of strengths. Um, yeah. So I, I, I do computational um, imaging, uh, design sensors, um, algorithms, and so on. I see Charlie Bowman is also on in this room. Um, maybe, maybe this question is more towards um, specific things. Like, as we design algorithms, what we are doing today is, hey, you give me a sensor, okay, be it um, spare camera or um, event camera. So you, you, you provide me that um, kind of device. And then I think really, really hard for a couple of months, okay, how am I going to use this sensor? So I want to flip this question around and I uh, want to ask uh, maybe uh, Bill or Charlie or other folks uh, in this uh, room who have some experience on this topic. Um, if you can talk to a sensor guy, okay, talk to a sensor guy, I want a new functionality. Um, can you make it for me? Um, and you can only ask for one functionality. <laughs> okay. What functionality would you, would you want? And assuming that person can make it for you. So what, what, what would you want? Well, I've been looking for oh, time. So let's, let's let him to go first. Hi, Charlie. Oh, oh, okay. I'm, uh, okay. Uh, Am I supposed to be answering this? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can, you can, Charlie. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, um, you know, one thing that comes to mind, I don't know if it's an answer to your question, but uh, I think a lot of people know Sergio Goma from uh, Qualcomm. Uh, oh, hi, Bill. I think maybe you know him. Uh, uh, and he, he's, uh, I think they were, he's talked about, and, and I'm not an expert in this area, but integrating uh, sensors with computation, local computation, they have this technology where they basically just fabricate two um, uh, devices that are so flat that when you put them together, they effectively bond and they can communicate. So, you know, maybe, so, I mean, maybe the broader question you were asking, uh, Stanley, is that if we had control of, uh, of the design of the sensors rather than just the algorithms and we wanted code, integrated code design, where should we be going with that? And um, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of potential along those lines, and maybe that's uh, feathers rather than wings, but maybe it's important feathers. Um, it's sort of like foveation. But, but, but mm-hmm. what kind of functionality would you want, Charlie? Right? You, you have a cell phone, you have cameras, you have X-ray. 
What do you want, Charlie? I'm not sure, uh, but maybe uh, what I want is um, uh, probably in real applications, you're always, uh, or, or in future real applications, you're going to be limited by data rate. So maybe you want a lot of, it's sort of like these neuromorphic cameras where you have a lot of summary information that you can uh, uh, provide and then uh, you can uh, you use that to extract the kinds of information that uh, Bill was talking about doing reconstruction in ways that you might not expect to be able to. You know, one other thing I want to throw out here, not to change the subject, but is uh, I'm not a, you know, I, you know, I'm, um, okay, I don't consider myself really a vision researcher per se. So, uh, uh, you know, maybe I don't have the depth of experience, but, but one thing that I, when I think about vision, it seems like there's a lot of problems where we've made a lot more progress than I expected to make in the last decade. Uh, or the last 15, 20 years, that uh, you can really solve some really amazing vision problems in terms of having a static image, or you have a video, and you can tell me a lot about what's going on there with high reliability using automatic methods, right? But, uh, but somehow that doesn't seem really intelligent in some sense. Uh, like it's, it's doing something, it's giving you the answer to your problem, it's not insightful. I don't really feel like the computer has a lot of understanding. Okay. Um, and so I don't really have um, the expertise to be able, I can ask the question. I don't have the expertise to answer. What does it take for a vision system to have really understanding of what's going on? And, and um, I kind of feel like it involves a certain amount of dynamic process where, uh, because understanding relates to action and intent. Okay. So, um, so, I guess my question to Bill is this, are, is dynamic vision, like, you know, where there's interaction, not just a video in which you process it, but interaction between the uh, vision algorithms and system and the uh, sensing device, uh, is that wings or feathers? Mm, well, that's a great question. Um, yeah. So, uh, well, uh, it's something I think a lot about. Uh, so, I love the simplicity of a passive system. You just set up your algorithm in front of a TV set and let it watch for a year and then you come up with a good vision system. That would be really cool. But um, I talk about this with my friend, Rich Sutton, who's big on reinforcement learning. And he thinks, no way, no way, you can't do that. You've got to interact. You've got to uh, poke and prod. Uh, and that's the only way you can learn how to see or understand the world. And that might be true. I sort of, I, I'm sure it helps. I, I'm still somehow feeling like you could just do it by looking at, you know, looking at all of YouTube, spend a year watching YouTube, and you can really understand a lot about the world. Um, so anyway, I'm sure it helps to be interactive. So so is it feathers or wings? I don't know. It, you know, maybe it's wings. You you know, it could be that you just got to poke the world in order to understand the causal structure of the world. And and so therefore, maybe it's wings. Um, I guess it's as an ex as a researcher, it's so much easier to, to compartmentalize everything if it's if you can if you don't have to build a robot in, in order to understand how to see. Um, by the way, I just wanted to go back and answer uh, Stanley's question. I, I, I would love to have a differentiator as in my sensor that comes comes back with a um, high dynamic range derivative of what's falling on the sensor. Um, I mean, obviously you can do it digitally, but you, you're, you're at, a, at the mercy of your quant, quantizer and, and uh, signal to noise issues. And, and, and I should say, uh, I have to credit that um, uh, Jack Tumblin wrote a paper on why he wants a differentiating camera. And I just, I, I thought that was just such a great idea. Uh, I want to credit Jack for that. And you can build a really nice analog differentiator. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't have to be digital. So. Doesn't, yeah. Okay. Yes. So talking about this dynamics, I wonder um, if Ed or Jeff, you have any comment on, on that. I think Charlie asked a very interesting question, right? So, so you want to understand not just from the static scene, you also have this dynamics that's involved um, in, in the scenario. And I know you guys, uh, Ed and Jeff, you have been working a lot on this space. And, and any thoughts on that? Is it feather or wings from your perspective? Maybe Jeff? So, um, I don't know so much about feathers, but what people lose track of is that 
um, biological flights can do things that human aircraft or human designed aircraft can't do and vice versa. So human designed aircraft can fly supersonically and birds cannot. But a bird, which has a, um, a flexible wing, a non-articulate or a complex articulated wing, um, can be at a high altitude. It could pull its wings in and it could enter um, ballistic motion phase, um, fall ballistically, and just at the right time, spread out its wings and um, attenuate its motion and catch a prey. Um, and um, that's something that uh, human engineered aircraft are not able to do. And each is optimized for a different kind of functionality. Um, the same thing holds true, getting back to your issue of sensors. There are sensing modalities that we can engineer that can do amazing things that the human eye can't even begin to do, like MRI and CAT scan and the like. No matter how much you try a human staring at a um, at, a, at another human body can't see inside the body, whereas ordinary everyday medical imaging does that to very, very good purpose. So there are, there are sensors that if I could have in my wildest dreams, if you could provide me, um, it would be great. Um, generally, if you can increase the spatial and temporal resolution, um, you know, by several orders of magnitude of, of brain imaging, that would be amazing. If you could um, uh, image uh, directly the, um, uh, the, the neurological activity, um, not indirectly through both, um, that would be amazing um, engineering capability. Um, and it would have nothing to do with computer vision, but it would be tremendous for uh, neuroscience. Um, uh, I don't really have the answer to what kind of sensor I would want if I were trying to do computer vision. That's just a completely different question with a completely different range of possible answers that I haven't thought about very much. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Oh, I see a hand raised. Um, Chi, Chi, do you want to? Uh, a comment something here yes yes uh, hi bill hi everyone so i just joined here uh this month and um all the way from boston so very nice to see you uh, from yeah. boston um so regarding uh, i first want to echo with uh what bill has said about the uh, differentiator camera so um so i, I was thinking maybe like building such kind of uh, sensor that outputs the differentiation of images can be a combination of both the optics and uh, the electronics. So uh, if we are able to um, make the optical design such that uh, the pointer function uh, obtained uh, for the images follow certain kind of properties, maybe like it will be very easy uh, for a like a uh, for, maybe it's very easy for an electronic operation to obtain a robust image that is a differentiation of the original ones. And uh, so that, um, la that leads to my imagination of a future camera. So I really hope um, that the optic side of the camera can be like, um, can perform much more type of computation uh, hmm. than what we currently can do. So currently, um, I, um, I see a lot of people using uh, diffractive optical elements, uh, or some people are doing nanophotonics. So they, they are able to uh, manipulate, uh, the, for example, the phase and intensity uh, of the light wave that pass through it. I'm wondering if we are able to do nonlinearity operations um, on the light that goes through certain kind of optics. 
If so, uh, the kind of computation we are able to enable um, for uh, for a piece of camera can be much, much, um, like much, much more uh, expanded. Yeah. So that, those are my comments. That's very exciting. That's very exciting. Yeah. I will just add a co couple comments from my from my very selfish perspective. I I been working on tensor for for a couple of years and and um, I um, I know analog processing I know digital processing 14 bit 12 bit 16 bit processing I want to have a sensor that's one bit hmm. one bit binary okay one bit binary as soon as the signal comes to your sensor I want it to just dump your binary response one or zero okay and and then what do you get? Well, you get you get speed, you get resolution because the pitch can be a lot smaller. Um, you also will be able to sense the, the signal in a completely different way. You, 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 you are still digital, but then you are binary digital. And so you can you can do motion if you can track them. You can do dynamic range because I can fuse them. So 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 in my imagination, some kind of sensors along the slide. Well, we've been doing something along uh, this line, which is quantum image sensor with Eric Foster. Um, but I think that's still a really, really long way to go, right? This binary sensor that's replacing the whole sensor today, not analog, not digital, but it's a binary sensor. That would be really, really, really cool if we can build it. So that's what I, I, I've been thinking. Sounds great. Sounds nice. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, um, I want to uh, switch gear a little bit um, to um, another question, uh, which is, um, I know there are a lot of students in this room and they are really excited about computer vision and, um, and they want to publish in CDPI and so on. Maybe I can ask um, Bill and also maybe other um, panels for their opinion. Um, wh what is publication? It, this is really vague. What is publication? What, in your mind, what caused you to become a good um, publication, right? There are different metrics. I know schools, um, people, employers, they have different metrics, but in your mind, what is a good piece of paper? Like what, 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 hmm. what, what is good? That's a great question. Um, so I, I'll just jump in and I really want to hear what the other people say, so I'll be brief. Um, so, so this is something I wrestle with all the time. Um, also in evaluating faculty candidates and so forth. Um, and I have to say, I, I'm, I've really been thrown for a loop by the neural network revolution. It's much harder for me to evaluate things now than it used to be. Um, you know, there's, it, it's possible to get in and make contributions uh, with, with a much you know, much earlier in one's career than, than it used to be possible uh, because there's uh, the tools are so accessible. I mean, which is great, but it's just it's just finding it confusing. So I love to have some crazy new idea, some some new way of looking at things, uh, something that you something that you'll do differently now that you've read the paper than you would have done if you hadn't read the paper or something you're excited about. Those are all the things I love. And that's, of course, in conflict with what what's a great way to get a CVP, CVPR paper in, which is to have, you know, a table with all these rows and your rows have all the bold numbers in them. You know, that's, that's a great way to get a paper in, but it's not necessarily um, the one with the great new ideas. And so, so I'm really torn about that. And I, I really love the great ideas papers, but they're hard to evaluate and somehow even harder to evaluate now. Anyway, I want to hear other people say too, though, because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll start with Ed. Ed, Ed should have a lot of um, experience with uh, advising students. Well, I, I, I'll just label myself part of the walking wounded here. But, um, I, you know, my, my concern is um, many times people uh, that are jumping in and using all these uh, neural network tools, for example, uh, they lack understanding and how they really work. I don't know how many times that I've been at CVPR in the last couple of years where I walk up to somebody and listen to their poster. And then I ask them, explain to me how it really works. And you, you, you get a lot of people that are sort of choking when I, when I do that, you know, when I ask those questions. So I, I think it's important to have, um, to have insights. You know, one of the things I, I, I teach a, um, 
uh, Bill, we have this course here, it's called Vert Vertically Integrated Projects, where we form teams of students uh, from freshmen all the way up to seniors, uh, and they work on research problems, okay? And, you know, 99 out of 100 students, they want to do something with machine learning, whatever that means, okay? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I ask them, I say, well, you know, you want to you wanna fly on an airplane uh, that was designed by engineers that use the neural network system, uh, and they didn't really understand how it works. You want your grandmother on that plane? And you can figure out what the answer is. So I, I think that's what I would see. I'd also like to see students do, it, do, it, that doing computer vision image processing uh, learn a little bit more about uh, you know statistics and probability theory, like your introductory thing where you say, okay, let's just take a Bayesian model, make some Gaussian assumptions, and let's see where it goes. Uh, I bet there's a lot of people that say they do computer vision um, or image processing that couldn't do that or understand it because everything has to be solved by a neural network. You know, why did you take 100,000 samples and put it into ResNet or something like that, Professor Freed? Well, what's wrong with you? You're swimming in the opposite side of the river. You know what I mean? So that's what I would like to see is more understanding about how things work. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. So let, let me let me ask the other, other 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 folks on the panel. Maybe Katik, do you have any comments? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a basic uh, geometry guy. You know, just points, lines, and triangles. So I like to build up uh, foundations uh, for spatial geometry in in computer vision. So I like to see a lot of uh, more geometry content uh, uh, based on the foundations. Uh, you know, can can uh, um, can you solve? Uh, certain uh, higher order problems, especially guiding it with the structure uh, that you can um, garner uh, from outside the vision area. Uh, so I kind of believe in more um, special purpose uh, AI algorithms and computer vision, and also uh, want uh, more human uh, uh, input into the AI system. So there's a lot of gap between uh, what the AI, AI systems can do today and what humans are capable of doing. So even if we think about AI as uh, helping or aiding humans, you know, the gap is substantial and leads to a lot of issues such as trust, uh, as you point out and so on and so forth, right? So, um, and, and many of my colleagues in EC, like Saurabh and others are looking in deeper into the those types of issues. I think there are a lot of uh, important aspects, but I like to think of AI and, and vision also um, being used for, you know, non-damaging AI versus more things that can cost more damage. There are a lot of um, areas where vision uh, can be used, but not be harmful if it fails. So, um, and, and, you know, this is a mix of these problems. And, and of course, we are uh, entering this autonomy age and uh, major questions of uh, reliability and trust all come in. So there are a lot of interesting cans of worms this AI has opened, as uh, Bill pointed out. Um, we are in that world, unfortunately, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, I still like to inspire my uh, problems with basic geometry. Yeah. Maggie. Yes. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, there's another um, point sort of to bring to this discussion related to your original question of how do we advise students, right? Because, um, you know, I, we're sort of in this era and then there is, I feel like a larger environment in which whether you are applying a job, you're applying a school, you're evaluating a candidate, it's about where you publish, how much you publish, and how reputable those you know publication venues are, right? And sometimes it becomes difficult to you know see you know the potential of the work. And then I don't know about you know those of you in the panel in the audience, but you know I've had experience where you know we worked on something we feel is interesting, and then you know it's a little bit immature. But then yes, the reviewers agree it is interesting problem, and then you know it's uh, it's it's something worthy explore. However, we're not seeing enough of these big tables with bold numbers. <laughs> so so I mean I, I feel like it's a struggle, right? We want our student to be successful, and then you know a lot of them come in and say, hey, I want to be successful. I want to publish in you know CDPRs and all of that, and then how do I get there? So how do we advise them? Um, I mean, how do we, you know, I don't know, influence change, you know, to cultivate um, a better environment for kind of educating the next generation of students, right? So, um, 
you know, we want them to understand um, how things work, right? We want, I mean, they're going to be engineers, you know, uh, research scientists. So they're going to influence what comes next in the future. Um, and that's more of like a question for me because I struggle with that too. Um, that's actually a good question. It's, a, it's actually a good question for us as faculty to think about because um, we, we sort of um, on a different side of the river uh, compared to with students, right? Um, because because students they're really in a rush to graduate and to get jobs and they need those numbers. Um, but on us, we have we sort of okay now. Um, if I have um, um, I have a uh, uh, like a, like a year gap, I can do a sabbatical. I can just do work on something else. Um, I, I think Maggie, you are you're raising a really really good point, and I I can see the tension, but I don't have a solution i all i can do is just to encourage students um, to think big to think big but as it goes to the publication we also got to face the reality to create big tables i don't have a solution either i i'm not sure if it's a it's a building culture already to this community because it's getting big because it's getting competitive i i don't have a solution but i can i can sort of just sympathize with all our, our students maybe i can hear more from from our other faculties or a uh, 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 bill, anything that we as faculty nowadays can do to help our students. On one hand, they want to get a job, I understand. But on the other hand, don't lose their, their, their great talents of just <laughs> spending so much time on the, the table. What can we as faculty do to help our students? I think that's such a good question. Um, I'll just jump in. I don't have an answer. I want to hear what other people say too. Um, but um, you know, we we have it's, as as you say, we have so much more patience because of our different career stage than the students do. And so, for us, for a paper to get rejected or even to get rejected twice, uh, it's not the end of the world. You know, there's paper deadlines coming all the time. It just you know, use the valuable feedback from your viewers and make it better. Uh, but that's a really hard it's just very hard i think uh, to be at an early stage uh, in one's career and and receive one or two rejections on a piece of work um and i don't know the solution to that i mean i i try to tell people the students don't worry about it you know it, 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 sometimes it goes from rejection to a best paper you know it really can be um it, you just keep working at it but it's it's a hard hard uh hard message to hear i think do other people have it? So what do other people do? Yeah, yeah I wonder what other people think. Uh, um, Ed or uh, maybe Charlie, any 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 input on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would just say my philosophy, I, I don't know if it's the best philosophy, okay? But I just try to ignore a lot of the hubbub. And um, I know it sounds kind of naive, but I try to do the right thing. Like, uh, uh, I try to just say, you know, what is really important here? And uh, and if you have a paper rejected, um, uh, you know, take the feedback and try to incorporate it, try to look at it from the reviewer's point of view, and really try to keep focus on making a valuable contribution as opposed to hitting some specific goal. I mean, I feel like, uh, particularly as the, the success of these fields uh, in computer vision, you know, image processing, computational imaging, has led to the participation of a lot of people. So I think that the communities tend to naturally um, create barriers to entry. So mm -hmm. you have to know the secret handshake and they pretend that the secret handshake is really important. We all, but I believe many times the secret handshake is silly. It's just something they've created so that uh, they could <laughs> call down the number of people they have to consider and reduce their competition. So I tried to just really focus on doing valuable work that I think is important. And I try to have a small group of friends that are that I whose opinion I trust. And I ask them to give me honest feedback. And if they think of what I'm doing is jump, they go, you know, Charlie, we like you, but this is just isn't very interesting. So I move on. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have another question I want to ask, uh, not to change the subject, but Bill, you have a really unique perspective because you've been in industry, really deeply embedded in industry, and it's related to the previous question, but also deeply embedded in academia. 
Uh, you know, as an academic, I tend to think that academics have more silly bean counting, but I'm sure there's a lot of silly bean counting in industry too, um, probably, you know, because the grass is always a little greener on the other side. But I'm just curious, and but there's another dynamic that's occurring in this space, which wasn't always true in the past, maybe for other fields, that in areas like um, machine learning, let's say specifically, uh, there's an argument that being made that industry is ahead of academia. Okay, maybe others will disagree, but there's at least some people who believe that's true because you know it's really core to their mission. There's a lot of resources. You know, okay, let me. The salaries are dramatically higher. Okay, uh, and um, uh, so they attract really enormous talent. So, uh, but you know, uh, academics we like to think that we're free thinking and the dark side of tenure and so forth. So do you have any perspective on that, on the relative balance between those and also how we can better get synergy between those? Because maybe they have different things to bring to the table. Uh, thanks, sure, I'm happy to comment on that. Um, but then I, I wanna put it on the stack that I wanna ask other people to, you know, how to protect students from the CVPR uh, steamroller. But um, okay, on, um, on industry and academia, yeah, well, Industry is is exploring this notion that everything bigger is better, and and still even more bigger is even more better, <laughs> um, and they're they're exploring that, and you know we'll see where it goes. But uh, my friend Yair Weiss, uh, you know, reminds me and others that this whole thing, this whole juggernaut, this whole frenzy of neural networks started with one academic and one graduate student working on something for two years in isolation you know that's that's where it came from and and surely the next big thing is also going to come from that kind of uh environment where you know it, ac academics do have more freedom than people in industry uh, um on the other hand yes it is my, I, I always wonder whether the right model for what's going on is what happened with the semiconductor industry, where you know uh, industry has the best semiconductor manufacturing and academia doesn't. And uh, is that the way it's going to go with machine learning too? I hope not. Uh, I still think there's a lot of room for creative, uh, crazy ideas to change to change the industry coming from academia. But I I fear that that I don't know. That's that, that's that's, I'm, that's what keeps me hopeful actually. Okay, good. So what, can, I, can I chime in for a second? Yes, yes. Because I'd like to uh, uh, follow along the lines of what uh, Bill um, quoted Yair as saying, which is something that I try to remind my students, um, which a lot of young entering PhD students these days um, see the um, deep learning revolution and think the world started with Alex in 2012. And um, what they don't have the perspective that some of us older folks have is that the nature of the entire field of computer science, not just computer vision, not just AI, but all of computer science, is that there's a progression of what you might call paradigm shifts, what you might call fads. And every paradigm shift, every paradigm, and every fad lasts for a while. Some last longer than others, but they all come to an end. They necessarily have to come to an end because if you think about it, if you have a topic and an approach that um, a huge community, a community as large as the uh, combined um, computer vision, um, machine learning, AI, natural language, robotics community, um, is at this point with many tens of thousands of people um it can't go on for very long until one of two things happens either we solve all the problems and then there's nothing left to work on or the methods run out of steam they ask them to and the field ceases to make progress and the only way people make progress is by a paradigm shift um, that creates a discontinuity so if you look at the way things have worked, not just with the current paradigm, but with all paradigm shifts over the past 60 years or so since the dawn of computing, is that there are these um, discontinuous increases that in performance or ability functionality that happen when there's a paradigm shift. 
And then there's a slow march up from the curve until it asymptotes, and then there's another discontinuity. So I have no doubt that whatever we're working on now is going to um, asymptote. It's going to dry up at some point. It might be two years. It might be five years. It might be 10 years. I don't know exactly how long, but it will. And at some point, there will be a new paradigm shift. I don't know what it is. I wish I did. I'd be ahead of the curve at this point. Um, but what I tell my students is when you graduate with a PhD, you have another 30 or 40 years in your career ahead of you. And over the course of that career, there are going to be five or eight paradigm shifts. And you have to prepare yourself to, um, to ride all of those, to, um, to persist through all of those. Um, and so it's not so important to uh, become an expert just at the current fad. You have to, you have to get the, the good sense about how to run your entire research career to, to persist across all the different paradigm shifts that are going are gonna to happen over the next 30 year or 40 years. Great. That's an excellent point. Yeah. So um, I, maybe I should ask Maria, how much time do we have left? Is Maria here? Oh, I don't see her here. Um, so I, I, I'm just looking at the agenda. I, I think um, we are um, at the time, um, 4.45. So I, I, I wonder how, um, how the audience um, feel about us. Um, do you have more questions we want to chat about or um, we should also, or, or we should honor this time and shall we, shall we get a get stop here? Um, I, I'm open. I, I, have, I have a lot of time. Okay, I'm free this afternoon. So um, I, I just wonder what, what, what do you guys want to uh, wanna do? Dr. Chan, I just need to uh, just, I want to just let everybody know that we were actually out at time. So Okay. Okay. I'm sorry to do that to you. I'm so okay. sorry. Sure. Sure. No problem. No Great problem. Great session, though. Thank you. For, yeah. For no problem. Thank you, Maria, for, for for monitoring this. Um, um, but I guess um, I, so 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 let me just say a couple words to uh, conclude this um panel. Um, I it, it just first of all, I really want to thank Bill for for spending this afternoon with us. I, I think this is really really really, um, stimulating. Uh, the the talk is just so stimulating. I, 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 I just cannot believe, at least I'm learning a lot, right? How, how to become persistent on the problem for a long time and then make some real progress. Although, although we see a lot of failures, never mind, just keep doing this. This is a really good lesson for me. And there are lots of great ideas that I'm learning. Lots of great discussions in this panel. Thank you everyone for participating, sharing your comments, I guess. Um, one challenge I will just bring it to everyone is really how do we help our students? I think this is really a burden for me. Okay, how do we help our students? How do we encourage them to really think big while at the same time, we also need to acknowledge uh, the need uh, for, for those job markets. That's a challenge for us. Maybe um, in the near future when we meet in person, maybe we will have some ideas. Um, I hope um, Bill can visit us uh, hopefully later this year. I really want to show you around the campus, I'll have a student show you some interesting imaging through turbulence work that we can talk about. Um, so I really look forward to that. Um, again, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you uh, students, faculty for joining us. Especially thank you, uh, Bill, for uh, virtually coming to this event. Uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. And, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I will take you up on that invitation. I will come visit you and, and I'll look forward to it. Thank you. Um, it, I learned a lot in this panel and thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. Um, look forward to see everyone um, hopefully on campus very soon. Thank thanks, you. Bill. Bye. Thanks, Bill. We really appreciate it.